The, the title is what, Journey to Economic Growth. It, there's a nice formal title. We, internally, we call it the Billion Dollar Women, right? Because the, the three uh, business people you see on stage that Arnold Soar is going to be talking to are amazing, uh, both individually and collectively. And the wisdom uh, that all of you should be able to take away from this is going to be something special. So uh, I'm glad you're here. You're blessed to be here. So uh, we always do this. We always want to make sure we thank our sponsors who help make this possible. So for the, this plenary session, our sponsors are DuPont and Anthem, our overall event sponsors. Again, we always thank Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, and our three MBE sponsors, Acro, Amcus, and Kaiba. Please give them a round of applause. And, you know, let's thank our, you know, well, I'll, I'll let, I'm going to let Arnold handle all this good stuff. So quick, quick introduction of, of Arnold Soa, for, for those of you who don't know. Um, he's the Senior Vice President and Chief Procurement Officer of MetLife. He's held positions uh, in, in a number of spaces in risk management, an advisor to Ally Financial, uh, CPO of Capital One, um, and you know, has some really great insights on risk management. Uh, I get the good fortune of dealing with him as the Treasurer of NMSDC and under his leadership. We went out of the red and into the black. So please give Arnold a round of applause as he's going to moderate this session. Arnold, come on up. Thank you. You're going to moderate for All right. All right. Is this, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. So I won the lottery because I get to be here with these three <laughs> wonderful women. Um, so, and what we're going to do today is try to make this more of a discussion. Uh, I got uh, some questions. I'm going to ask them, and, but then hopefully we'll have plenty of time. We have a microphone in the back that we can have questions from the audience. So first, I want to start off with uh, some brief introductions. Um, you know, to my left is Carmen Castillo from uh, SDI International. And then I have Janice Bryant uh, Halroyd. Yay. Yes, from the Act One group. And I have Andra Rush from Detroit Manufacturing. And, and I'm going to start off by asking each of them to do just a a brief introduction of themselves, tell us a little bit about their business, um, you know, and, and their, a little bit about their journey to, be, to being here. You want to so, start? Yep, okay, start with you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I started SDI 25 years ago this month, celebrating my 25th year in business. Wow. Thrilled. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, we started in South Florida with the internet, beginning of technology, beginning of the internet, knowing that technology was here to change our lives forever, that the world will become very, very flat and rapidly. So we designed SDI International, which is why we picked up the name International, to be a global company right from its inception. We got, uh, in two years, we have the basis here in the States, and two years later started expanding overseas in Canada, in Europe, in Asia Pacific, in South Africa, just about everywhere. The only place where we really don't have a present nowadays is in Australia. And what we do, we started as a staffing, technical staffing company. The company naturally evolved into more of a managed money services company. And lately, the last decade, 15 years pretty much, we're very, very focused in purchasing. We manage the tail end of the supply chain, which is actually the vast majority of the supply chains. Large corporations such as IBM, Lenovo, yourself, you have thousands and thousands and thousands, thousands of suppliers, and you pretty much only utilize the first tier suppliers, your core suppliers, and you don't pay much, much attention to the balance, which is the majority, which is about 65 to 70 percent of the supply chains. And that's what we do. We do the sourcing, the purchasing, the negotiating of contracts, the management of the suppliers worldwide, the reducing those suppliers. We have our own um, supplier inclusion program that I started 20 years ago, because thanks to this organization, I'm here. My business is huge. We, we manage over $3 billion worldwide. And uh, so we started the supplier inclusion uh, program about 20 years ago. And the last few years, it's becoming global. 
where many of you, many of you suppliers, I have quite a few suppliers in here, you have an opportunity to grow your business and spend overseas just by being a partner with us. Mm. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Janice? Arnold, thanks. Good morning. And, and happy anniversary, NMS DC. Hey. Yes. Um, it's all, Carmen and I are so similar in our business offerings. Uh, the Act One Group does offer workforce technologies and solutions as well as procurement solutions. We operate from a mindset of total talent management. So um, it's been an enjoyable journey for me because I started the company in 1978. I was thinking as I walked in here that when I started my company, I started in front of a rug shop. I made a deal with the guy that I could have a really good address in return for. Now these are really fancy rugs we're talking about. Um, but um, it gave me the opportunity to have the address I needed. And I think the ladies up here will share that sometimes, you know, that location back in the day meant a lot. I mention that because now, uh, these many years later, we truly are operating from global and cloud environments in a way that uh, mobility certainly is important, but it's the technology and the risk aversion that we bring to clients in a way I think that's so progressive for them that allows them to trust the relationship they have with us. Through my Agile One brand, we offer workforce solutions and technologies that do, as, uh, as Carmen spoke in detail to, so I won't define it uh, again, procurement solutions as well as talent solutions. That's resourcing across the globe. We have brick and mortar in 22 countries. Um, we, I also, in the Act One group, have background checks and solutions, background screenings and solutions under the brand of A-Check. And then Apple One is our lead uh, staffing brand. I'm really excited because we do great business with you as well, Arnold, so we're very happy about that. He's, he, his organization is supporting diverse suppliers, um, and um, Pauline has led us to a lot of great opportunities, as many people here. But my story of success, I think, is not complete without mentioning the success of many of the suppliers in this room. Suppliers like Pyramid. Pyramid, are you in the room? Yes, she is. Yeah, Pyramid Staffing are really superior staffing companies. So I think the big message is that NMSDC, many of us have grown our businesses through the support of NMSDC, and that means dynamically that we're supporting each other as well. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Andra, obviously. But I started, uh, not as similar as you, but I started in 1984 with three trucks. And it was more like FedEx. And I was so young, I didn't know what I didn't know. But I had heard that you could get, uh, being Native American, you'd have these set-aside contracts that would have 25% profit. So I figured I'd start this trucking company. They'd call me up. Pretty soon, I'd have all this business with all these profits. I'd retire at 27, go back to work at 50. Told my grandmother and grandfather, hey, I started a business, it's gonna happen. And then I couldn't figure out why the phone didn't ring. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I had a two-line phone. I'd, I'd take line two and call line one. What? Yeah, it works, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I ended up calling, uh, coming to the MM. BDC is what it's called, and started networking and, and made a lot of mistakes. But through it, uh, I, I had a passion to make a positive difference, especially uh, underserved communities, but also in our Native American communities. And through starting off as like an expediter or your last hope, we grew it in a total transportation uh, business, pretty much regionally in, in North America. and. Uh, outside of growing in transportation because everything comes by truck. We then expanded it to uh, creating manufacturing jobs because to me, it, it was a great way to have, uh, we all want the opportunities and crack the door open, don't give us a handout, but give us a hand up. Let us compete and show you what we can do. And through that attitude and so many great people and so many wonderful customers, uh, we grew not only in transportation, but also in developing processes to assemble 
complete interiors for major auto brands. Started off with GM, then Ford, then Chrysler, Toyota, and uh, beyond that, then created manufacturing jobs because as you know, manufacturing jobs create eight to 10 uh, secondary jobs and really fuel the, uh, the economic growth. So right now, the Rush Group with Dakota Integrated Systems, Detroit Manufacturing, and uh, Rush Trucking have over 4,000 employees, and many of them have been promoted and, and developed careers. So I'm really glad to be here. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So, so as I said, I got some prepared questions, so think about, start thinking about your own questions. But before I ask the first question, I understand you have a special message for some folks in the audience, is that right? We have a very special okay. message for some folks in the office. In the, in they office. all they have. In the office. <laughs> I know, we're, I, that's we're why I always office. say that. <laughs> but we do, we have okay. a very okay. special message. Yes, we do. We so, want to say. Go ahead. Go, go, no, you, you do, go. you do, no, you do. No, okay. <laughs> we want to sing, everybody stand up. We okay. want to sing happy birthday to Carlton and Wayne today who are NMSDC members as well. Where's Carlton? Who's the best singer right in the house? All of us. Are we going to go? Oh, we're going to go. Okay. One. I'm Arnold. not singing. Oh, come Arnold, on. come on. You oh, got to no, sing. You don't want to hear me. You got to Three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> we got you, Daniel. We got you, Daniel. Some of y'all singing one birthday and some of y'all singing another, right? Yeah. We'll go with the legacy birthday. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Carlton and Wayne. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. All right, thanks. All righty. <laughs> so, so we're here at the NMSDC's conference in Detroit. So uh, it's our 45th birthday, speaking of birthdays. So the NMSDC is 45 years old. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, I'm going to start off again the same order. You know, how did you first get involved in the NMSDC and how did you leverage it to grow your business if you did? I mean, is, was oh. it key to your growth? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so if, if you could. <laughs> almost, okay. almost 100 percent of my business is because of the MNSNDC. Okay. This is the only place where I see my clients, my potential clients, my suppliers, a net, an incredible network of potential suppliers. Absolutely. I got engaged with MNSNDC 24 years ago. I started my business the day that actually that Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida. That was my first day in business, wow. talking about picking up dates. Yeah. And of course, it set me back for four or five months because the whole area was so destroyed. So basically, I started the business in 1993. By the end of 93, I was already certified with them and I said, this year with my local council, Miami, there she is, Beatrice. <laughs> got certified 24 years ago, and I started networking, and I must say, if it wasn't because of this organization and how the minority community has embraced all of us and worked with us, and you corporations, especially the corporations, we do have to say three hurrahs for the corporations, because if it wasn't for the committed corporations, boy, half of the business, it would be, my business will not be what it is nowadays. So yeah, thank you. Arnold, uh, the Act One group became familiar with NMSDC in a very different way. Um, there is a lady named Gwen Moore. I don't know if many of you know her name, but you know her legislation because in California, she was the originator of the uh, regulatory actions that require supplier diversity of utility companies that spearheaded a lot of the supplier actions like NMSDC. And she approached me in California and encouraged me that I should certify my business as a minority business. And I'm like, minority business? And you know, I thought I was doing great. I was doing about, what, 10, 12 million dollars a year and I was happy, life was great. Very local business. And she encouraged me that it wasn't just for my business I should certify now, if you know Gwen Moore, you know she can get up under the heart of you, right? And Gwen said, Janice, you've got to think about all the other companies because you certifying will allow you to do business with companies in a way that opens up the doors for other organizations. And um, 
So after a long conversation, I did decide to go through certification. Hollis and Gene Smith were running the Southern California Divider, uh, Supplier Diversity Development Council, and I met the NMSDC through that local council. That was back in the days when Harriet Michelle was uh, head of NMSDC. The Empress. And, and, and I went to Arizona shortly after getting certified to an NMSDC event she was speaking at. Harriet said something that has stayed with me all these years. She said it from a stage, so it really shocked me to hear someone say it that way. But um, she said, if it's on your ASS, I'm not going to say the word, if it's on your ASS, it's not an asset. And I looked around the room and I saw <laughs> nobody in shock but me. <laughs> and I learned then that they all knew her intimately. And that feeds to why it was really important to me how I met NMSDC, because she took me aside and introduced me to a man named Ray Jensen. Anybody in this audience remember Ray Jensen? I know if Glenda Gill's in the audience, she remembers him. You remember him, Pauline. And Ray Jensen pulled me aside and encouraged me. We built business through NMSDC, and it was Ray Jensen's effort, along with a couple of other companies, that um, Ray was with Ford, that um, actually supported our first uh, membership into Corporate Plus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, I echo everyone's comments. The NMSDC has been tremendous in our business expansion and growth. Uh, the MMBDC is where I started, and being in the automotive industry, the automotive industry has really taken the lead. As you heard yesterday, I think GM has 50 years, and Ford has 40 or 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, their p programs and policies have been amazing in giving us the opportunity. So it was shortly thereafter I met Harriet, mm -hmm. but I was in, I think they had like 5,000 people. When I started with the MMBDC, they had like maybe this little section was our whole business and all we did was have conferences to raise money. But in between that, the autos with their diversity leaders would reach out and help us uh, really grow into business and what is the right protocol and the wrong protocol. Because I tended to call on, the, once I got the phone ringing a little bit, I called on the buyers and then if uh, they wouldn't give you feedback, you know, you put a bid in and you wait and you think, well, gosh, it's been some time, I'm probably gonna win. And then you'd get a crooked fax, not even a straight fax. <laughs> you know, I'm like, a crooked fax. And it would come over and say, sorry, Good, good try. Uh, we're thank you for bidding. We'll see you in three years. <laughs> like three years, oh man. Do, do some of these young people even know what a fax machine is? Probably, these days? probably not. <laughs> I know. I, my sons go, you had dial phones? I said, yeah, really. I know, hard to believe. Yeah, <laughs> those are cool. <laughs> yeah, right. They're coming back in. But uh, through the through those programs and just starting locally and then expanding and broadening, and meeting tremendously. Uh, wonderful entrepreneurial leaders. I tried to put myself in, in situations, conferences like this, uh, charities that I had a passion for that also some of my customers had a passion for. So we find some commonality in which we could identify and grow. And I think a turning point was when the MMBDC had asked for the chief procurement officers to be chair. That opened up the, uh, the knowledge base for a lot of organizations to understand what it is to be a, a sole proprietor, a corporation where you put all your assets on the line, where you're the last to be paid. And, and that expansion helped develop the programs and opportunities we see today. And it, it only was uh, potentiated when NMSDC expanded around the world and started to teach how to do great contracting to suppliers. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I'm assuming, are all three of you Corporate, corporate Plus? Plus. Okay, yeah. so yeah. the next question I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna start with you this time so we work this way, okay? Okay. You know, so, the, so you are a Corporate Plus member. How, you know, so within NMSTC we have a, a program for minority owned businesses become Corporate Plus. Has that helped you even more? You know, how is that, how have you leveraged that? And would you have any advice for maybe some of the 
uh, minority-owned businesses in the audience who are not Corporate PLUS members, should, is, is that something they should look at? You absolutely should look at it if you want to expand beyond and outside of your industries and, and go national or, and or globally or do strategic alliances with companies that complement your business. So for us to expand into other industries because we're pretty uh, auto-dominated, uh, that was our avenue and caveat. So when we were nominated, they would then write letters to the ch top uh, chief procurement officer or VP of, uh, and, or the CEO of organizations that you might want to target, like Johnson & Johnson, which I hadn't been in, or Home Depot. So it really was a great avenue. I encourage it a lot. So it opened up a lot more doors? Yes, yes. Okay. What's been your experience? Uh, I think each of us are going to echo uh, one the other. Here's the thing, Arnold, about Corporate Plus. Corporate Plus is a nominated process. So when you are nominated by an organization, they are basically putting their stamp of approval saying this yep. organization has, for this company has performed well for me. This company has met all SLAs in the way that we need them met. They have financial prudence and they can manage growth. Their capacity to build is excellent. We know their team members. That's a dynamic reference before a reference is even sought. And so putting that seal of corporate plus on your bids, putting that seal of Corporate Plus on engagements and requests for meetings truly does open doors for you. The other thing I think it does is it allows organizations to understand that oftentimes you're working from some of the same uh, 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 quality performance metrics that they will use. So if any of you are engaged in quality programs and you have a Corporate Plus seal, that's an additional stamp for you. Uh, one thing about the Corporate Plus community is that the companies who are within, like each of us knows each other, uh -huh. and we really know each other. Uh -huh. um, and so it also gives you a strong network of minority-owned businesses who can share common opportunities and practices with you. It allows you to have a pre-vetted teaming partner if you determine that you want to bid in a teaming fashion. So it's dynamically a great thing to engage in. I would encourage you, if you're not yet ready for Corporate Plus in terms of scale, there are still wonderful ways to benefit from NMSDC. For me, my organization has actually benefited based on the engagement at the local chapter level that my employees will uh, operate from. Um, I actually have a, an executive in my organization who led a chapter years ago. So the, 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 I, I think it's that network of opportunity. It's also a network of responsibility because you won't hear any of us talk about growing our business without our responsibility to other companies. And there are many, as I mentioned earlier, suppliers in this room who I'm working with, they are part of that corporate plus factor too. Has that been your experience? Yeah, my experience. Actually, I'm one of the first three originals Corporate Plus member. Oh, okay. The only yeah. thing that she, she didn't add, or well, I'd like to add to her comments, is that you have to have a national agreement with a Fortune 500 companies that is a corporate member yeah. of the organization. You already have to be approved. You have to have a minimum of a national agreement for a few years. And that letter comes from the chief procurement officer. That has opened an incredible amount of doors for my organization, not only here in the States, but globally. Globally, like IBM was my, my Corporate Plus sponsor, and the work that Javet, who is sitting right there, and Michael Robinson, and all the others, boy, Jesus, if it wasn't because of them and their commitment to Corporate Plus, again, <laughs> is uh, yeah. impressive. It, it, it is interesting as a, you know, as a chief procurement officer of a, we were a Fortune 30. I know we spun off our retail business, so maybe <laughs> Fortune 100. Okay. Um, you know, we come across many minority-owned businesses, mm -hmm. and we're a big company. We're we're global, right? And so, which ones can actually serve us? You know, meet the needs. And I will say, I frequently pick up the phone, and or when I'm in meetings like this, talk to other CPOs and say, Hey, who are you doing business with? And we do compare notes, and this is a a uh, formal validation. Absolutely. If you will, so uh, you know, even from my perspective, I think it's yeah. a great program. Yeah, that program started in 1996 or 97. I got certified in 1998, and, and it's growing. And I really, again, I encourage every supplier and every chief procurement officer 
who is a corporate member to really work with your supplier. And if your supplier is delivering, if your supplier can really deliver on a national or on a global basis, you should, you should encourage absolutely. Yes. Let's, let's, let's be totally inclusive in the spirit of NMSDC and make sure that for those business owners who are present here today, if you're not yet ready for Corporate Plus, you still can team with other Corporate Plus members and learn a lot in mm -hmm. the process to ready yourself. That's the beautiful thing about NMSDC, is that while com corp companies may not be yet at the Corporate Plus level, they can still benefit from many of the programs by simply teaming or networking with other Corporate Plus members. And um, I think that when you do that, it gives you a more dynamic sense of your own readiness because you don't want to join Corporate Plus and be invited out by, by poor performance. Yeah. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. so I actually have a bunch more questions, but I think at this point I wanted to pause and see yeah. uh, if any members of the audience have questions. We have a, Judith with a microphone back there. So if you have a question, raise your hand and right. um, we'll try to... They'll try to answer. <coughs> I'm not going to. Yeah, you too. No, no, no. I'm just a moderator. Hi, ladies. It's such a privilege to be in the fine company of people right here in this room. My name is Prima, Prima Patil. I came to this country um, 18 years ago with $50 in my pocket, and I run a $5 million company. And I am really honored to be here. And my question to you guys is, what is one of your each success habits? I know you guys are really, really successful, but I wonder if you guys have a habit that you practice every day to be successful. So do you have successful habits that you, every day that you go through, you know, that you, you do that, that leads to your, or it's contributed to your success? The passion, the passion that you have the same day. Every morning when you wake up, you still have to have the same passion that you did when you thought about putting your business together. 25 years in business, and I get up every morning with the biggest smile, and thank you, God, that I still have a very flourishing business, and I'm, then I'm happy that I can create 2,000 jobs worldwide, and I can contribute to the economy, and I'm like, my gosh, that passion, that drive is what keeps you going. I start with uh, gratitude as well, you know, gratitude to our creator and gratitude for all the blessings. And I also, um, I'm very spiritual, so I pray a lot, And but I, I, I pray to make a positive difference in people's lives. <clears throat> and then uh, I'll check my phone to see if there's any emergencies <laughs> because, <laughs> because it doesn't matter if you're three trucks your thousand trucks or 4,000 people or 40,000 people, you're always checking to see, you know, once in a while you get a delight that someone's really happy and they tell you things that really make over the top days. But I, um, I, I look at that and then I, I try to uh, make sure I get some physical exercise. It hasn't been easy with three businesses right now, but uh, just try to get mind, body, spirit mm. together. So that's it. So put, get your cell phone out, become a millennial, and take some, take some notes, okay? First, ABCs, ask the right questions, then listen, listen, listen for the right answers. Listen more than you ask. Be where you say you'll be, when you say you'll be, importantly, how you say you'll be there. You've got devices that can help you get to where you need to be, but they can't help you be in the right frame of mind for it, in the right presence for it. And then you want to make sure that you have complete circular connect Activity. Many business owners send an email, as you said, you would wait for that bid to come back. <laughs> I'm sure in the process of growing Andra's business, she's learned that sending a message isn't the complete conversation. It's not complete until everybody who needs to know knows. One of the practices I have in my organization is that anybody who's employed in my company who sends me an email and mentions someone's name who is also in my company must copy them. 
okay? It keeps communication very on point, very focused, and very forward moving. Another habit is to understand that discipline is not a dirty word. Many of us think we sacrifice to build our businesses. That is totally wrong. The biggest blessing you can have is to be healthy in America with an opportunity to grow a business. And we can get very forgetful of that when we practice poor habits, which include watching one news station, watching too much stuff and not engaging, forgetting to vote at the local as well as the national level, and making certain that we are giving in to our communities. People talk about giving back. I never leave my community. I'm giving in to it, as, as NMSDC is a part of our community. The other thing I think was touched upon by each of these women, and I will say it not to be repetitive, rather, but rather to be iterative. Oftentimes when I'm working with young folk, um, I will encourage them that no matter who you call God, call God every day and then shut up and listen for the answers provided to you, you know? So, 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 so a string of habits, I'm an old, I'm probably, I'm, I, we've established I'm the oldest person on this stage. A string I'm of a habits. Second, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're kind of close, Arnold, but you look good. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 but, but these are the things that will really sustain you in your business. If I would add anything for you, your question is a very serious one. Um, I would add to you, uh, for you, that you, you must have continuous learning engaged in your life. Uh, you know, history's happening so much quicker today. Some of the clients I do business with who have been clients for 15 years are in totally different businesses today. They've redefined who they are. You mentioned IBM and, and the great Michael Robinson. Um, he will share with you that that business has redefined itself over and over in the years that we've done business with them. So you've got to have continuous learning engaged. And everybody, whether you're a millennial or not, become one. Stop treating millennials as if they're, you know, as if they're these aliens. Everybody went from age 19 to 35 has been a millennial. It's how you do it that matters. Get devised up. Get devised up. And do what you say and say what you do and follow through. I, I agree with all that. Thank you. You Thank say you. it so well. All right. Any other uh, questions we have? Uh, Good morning. Oh, yep. All three companies are privately held. Why did you not are go what? Uh, privately held? Yeah. Why did you not go public? And what is your succession plan if you have or are willing to share? Because going public is a pain in the neck. <laughs> We're not ready. Because you lose your privacy. <laughs> you don't want investor calls? Or? Yeah, right. That in my case, never thought of going public. Never. I just, I don't think my company is ready for that, number one. Number two, I don't think I want to be a public figure. I always said that the secret to my success has been my low profile. I do enough for people to know that I'm there. I do enough for corporations to know that I'm there. But the secret to my success is just be a very humble. I call myself a humble hustler. Very humble person, but I hustle for the, the hustle business. Is on it, though. Yeah. Trust me. yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just uh, corporations, our clients do not engage our services for us to be promoting that. We, they engage us to service them, to deliver. And when you don't, when you don't really focus on doing so, you, you just, no. So, I think most corporations do encourage you to grow. One of the things that you lead to though, Carmen, that's very important is we are the national minority supplier development council. And so, you want to be very thoughtful about how you retain your minority status in the process of doing that. If there's anybody in yeah. here who's looking to do it, I'm not going to judge people who choose to do that because people in our industry have done that. Yeah. And that has been successful for them, I believe. What I will say, speaking specifically for myself, is... One, I am peopled with some incredible executives in my organization who actually enjoy the spirit of entrepreneurship. 
often I will share with them as I do with, I, you, you'll get the theme, theme of me that I work a lot with universities and students. Uh, education has been my freedom. And so I, that's where I, I place a lot of my work. And um, I will share with my employees that, you know, freedom, we, 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 have, we have in our organization something called the feet we stand on. Freedom to innovate, excellence in delivery, because everything matters, time is invested to understand. When you, when you build an organization with that type of talent, even though my company was started in 1978, I've got very fresh, enthusiastic, innovative, smart talent who are still in the process of us being like a new company. We are very engaged in learning new ways to disrupt our industry in a positive Positive way and so going public would only serve for me to either retire without giving my son who is also engaged in my business an opportunity to build forward a second generation uh, foundation of wealth first generation starts it typically second generation spends it and by third generation is starting over again and you, some of you are laughing, but that is a very true thing. And so for me, because my son has indicated his interest and his ability, and he's supported by many of the executives in our organization to build it forward, it is a very natural process for us to remain where we are. The other thing is you mentioned, you, you, you will notice I mentioned the name of one of my comp company brands, Agile One. We work from a very agile uh, uh, perspective. Companies are looking for very different ways to develop talent communities today. And companies like Bristol Myers Squibb are demanding global solutions that give very global service. Uh, when you're looking to work with these type companies, you need to be very on point. And our ability to make quick decisions becomes very important in how we operate, as well as, as much as sometimes, our ability to stand on the experience that we've built. So I'm not looking to become public. Your companies you work with who utilize your diverse uh, or your, your diverse supplier status do need to be informed if you're going to make those types of decisions because there's positive disruption and there's negative disruption. Very often enterprise size companies deliver a lot into the suppliers they're working with and help to build them and it becomes grievous for them then to have to lose them because of that success. So thoughtful strategic decision making around that becomes really important. You're no longer only making in that decision for yourself. Carmen alluded to the fact you're making it for and about your clients as well. And we're not at that point where that's something that's, uh, that's that important to us. We really need the ability to be nimble and to perform in ways that a publicly held company might not offer us. Does that help? See, I learn every day. And, and I've just learned so much today. <laughs> but you say it so well. Uh, I looked at it when I was in my 20s and early 30s to, to go public, and it, I was too big to be small and too small to be big. Wanted to retain my uh, minority status and women-owned status, and it seemed that every time if I met with someone when I was 28, they said, oh, once you get it, 70 million. Then I'd meet with the, the people that take you public, the investors, and they say, oh, you need to be 100 million. And I'm, I'm saying, well, don't you need to make sure that if you're 100 million, you don't spend 101? I mean, come on, you should be profitable. But I thought it would give me more size and scale. And because of that trucking business, very capital intensive. What I find, though, is uh, as I get more and more exposed to publicly held companies, and there's wonderful companies out there, that the way the market works, they drive you more to a three month performance and a cash performance and a profit performance for the shareholders because you're responsible to the shareholders. And I think it would take definitely my focus and our team's focus away from uh, trying to do the best uh, job for our customers. There's one thing I will add for you. If going public is something you're thinking about, 
Many of your clients are publicly held companies. Buy stock in them and understand how they operate. Understand and read those annual reports. Be intimate as possible to their processes and the changes in their markets. And you can learn a lot about what to expect for yourself. Okay, thank you. I just have a quick question. I'm a chief diversity officer. I wanted to touch on workforce. You've got a lot of uh, cultural diversity on the panel. Everybody knows it's not a jobs problem, it's a skill problem. How do you find skilled labor to support your industries and how do you uh, support and empower the cultural affinity that you represent in that workforce? Oh, you're looking at me, Janice. Oh, well, I'll speak <laughs> you to it. I just, wanna, I, I just didn't think you wanted to keep hearing me. We, we do. We do. Um, I spend a lot of our time hiring the right people. I, I feel like the luckiest person here because I always try to hire the smartest people I can find. I do. I, for 25 years, I had the same executive. Those executives, their job is to hire brighter people than they are. I always consider myself the stupidest people in my own company. When I interview, I always said, if you're not smarter than me, if you don't know better than me, you're not gonna work for me. Yeah. When, you, when you get to that level, you always have to be like, you're there, your employees are here. We do have a global innovation team in all our centers of excellence worldwide that that's what they do. They're looking for very qualified candidates. They're looking for people that have the drive, the potential, the intelligence, and the whole package to grow with those centers of excellence, to grow with those locations, with those clients, and to be very committed to us. We work as a very large family. Uh, here in the States, um, I do a lot of business in the States, but mostly of my business is overseas, uh, worldwide. It's like 66, 65% overseas. The balance is here. And again, we do have a very strong human resources team and recruiters. That's all they do. And mostly a lot of referrals. So they know how? Us. How? Your question is how? Uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say in diversity, right? You were asking about yeah. how do you find the culture. Oh, you're talking in diversity? I'm sorry. No, no, you're talking about total talent community. I heard two, two content uh, issues in the question you asked. One is how are you finding talent given that it's skill sets that we're looking for? And people are abundantly, but it's skills we're looking for. And then the second part of your question I heard to address around uh, how are you making sure that that is uh, very inclusive community of oh. talent. Oh, that's what we was asking. Yeah, and everybody's looking for folks. Um, here, he, here's the thing, more than ever, companies now are poaching employees from outside of their industry. What we're learning is that the talent community itself is designing a lot of the way we must be proactive for it. Otherwise, we are simply responding to needs that are not met. We are looking at core data sets that people bring along with them. Oftentimes, it is as important to make sure they understand culture. We're not simply speaking about culture from a, from a geographic base so much as a work culture affinity. We utilize metrics and data to be highly predictive about outcomes from working with people, whether people can work individually or in teamed environments. We're also redesigning work to fit the skilled people, making sure that we understand that, because, you know, everybody who's sitting at the side of a beach with an iPad isn't just taking pictures of the sun. Some of them are designing uh, 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 stations that are operating in global environments. So we're finding that, and people, you, you heard me mention earlier about millennials and next gens, and people scratch their heads and have water cooler conversations about these people. They're bringing very new idea and thought 
to how work can occur in teams that are not, some work requires proximity and some work does not. And so you've got to make sure that you're measuring for those things. And there are very excellent tools that we use that allow us to make sure that this is being met for the client. At the end of the day, there are two things that work really well for me in terms of bringing talent into my own organization for the employees who work under checks that are full-time FTEs. Um, we're really blessed because we have a lot of people applying to us, so we don't have to put the search out that way. Finding talent for our clients requires that we do institute beyond our centers of excellence into utilize, utilizing data and referral systems and creating total talent networks. Ours does not begin at the point that someone is uh, experienced two or three years in a job. We have uh, very, very strong internship programs. Uh, our interns are very well paid. Some of our interns are earning $40 an hour. Did you hear what I said? $40 an hour, okay? <laughs> and, and these interns are working in different, uh, in different capacities that make them very rich and ready for corporate engagement. Um, corporations are hiring all levels of skills and jobs that mo we started out in an admin type way and technical placement and it was very simple and the job description fit one sheet. Today, that's a very different thing. So you've got to really be very specific about how you're searching data. And the thing about it is that the talent understands if you really can be a great agent for them and you can represent them well into organizations because the process you put them through for evaluation becomes very important. Having systems that are networked to support that talent community is a necessary enabler today. You must be able to have that community uh, available in a quick and ready fashion, whether it's an intern who can work as well, whether it's advantaging a company with the knowledge that because this job paid this much last year, does it need to pay this much this year, or whether it is having a ready alumni team of people who are available to come back into work on programs and, pro and, 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 and initiatives becomes very important. So there's no one single population a company is gonna hire from today. And if companies are looking to do that, they are going to lose in the talent search because it is war for talent today. And we've gotta be very thoughtful and very critical about how we're looking for that. I agree with everything she said. <laughs> However, I also want to go to actual skilled trades because in our country for the last three generations, we have said that to be a welder, to be a mechanic, to be a plumber, to be a process tech was settling and being uh, settling for mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we have 2.7 million skilled trade shortage in America hitting us in 2025 or sooner. The average age for a very skilled assembly line process technician mechanic repair person is 71, 71. The average age of a truck driver, which is not considered skilled trade because the law was back in 1930 something, is 64. I feel pretty good because mine are about 50, but it, it's, it's a very critical skill and it needs to be esteemed as if you want to work with your hands and you want to build things, I know robots are coming, but someone will have to even fix the machinery of the robots. Mm -hmm. So we need to be intentional on what we do. And when I'm trying to find people who have never entered into the job market, I want to give an opportunity when you start off as an industrial athlete that I, we will prepay tuition to educate, if you have the heart and desire, we'll prepay up to 5,600 a year for you to go to school and you take responsibility for the career you want to develop and we'll help lift you to that, so. Many, many people are also, <laughs> many people are also uh, working with, most people who attend a community college are gonna pay into that local tax base. People who attend some of the larger university uh, universities may be 
very diverse and geographically where they're going to work. But most smart employers understand that they can also create re-education for employees or for people who have the right everything else but need a specific uh, line of training with universities. Um, we're working North Carolina A&T State University. Aggie pride. Uh, oh, okay, great. A uh, 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 strong, strong engineering school, putting out the largest number of African American engineers in the nation and has a fastest growing population of white females and Hispanics in that school. They will work with you. You can develop programs in there or there in, in, in that school to have students graduate with specific skills. We work with Santa Monica College. It's one of the largest community colleges in the 100 plus college system in California. They, they, they are, are doing lots of education programs for uh, people who are already at work and want to retrain. And as you spoke to, Andra, it's really important to make sure that we don't overlook that segment of the population, so. Yeah, I mean, just one thing I'd add on this is, uh, you know, as a big corporate uh, entity, you know, we hire a lot of people. I know in my own department, I value diversity. I mean, that's why I participate in this program, because I value diversity in our suppliers. We value diversity in our employees. One of the things that I've tried to do uh, is make sure that the funnel, if you will, of where we go, we cast a broader net. Mm -hmm. You know, when I see people in my team, everyone they're interviewing is a white male, nothing against white males, but <laughs> I say, I want diversity of thought, right? I want diversity of approach. And we always hire the best, but I wanna make sure they're actually out there interviewing many different types. So we have actually, you know, what we've done, one of the things I've done is established, uh, and you mentioned, you know, sources of African Americans. So mm -hmm. We've, uh, we do uh, programs with Howard University. I live near, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and at NC State, we're doing things as well, and we're trying to identify diverse mm -hmm. candidates to hire as well. So it's finding that pipeline. Shelly Stewart, I don't right. know. No, you I have. Shelly yeah. Shelley started the program. Shelly has an incredible yep. program at Howard yep. University. That's the one we participate yep. in. Yep. yep. So. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. There he is. There he is. Shelly Stewart. Yeah. Shelly Stewart, you should stand up. You should stand up. Yeah. That's Shelly Stewart, program. guys. For those of you uh, who are from, from corporate America, I mean, that's a great program. We actually participate every year. We actually sponsor uh, a project with some students there. We've actually had internships with them. We've tried to hire a few. We lost them to like Google and places like that. And Shelly. And Shelly, that's right. Shelly takes first dibs, but, but yeah. So I think it's really about getting the, the net mm -hmm. out and then hiring the best from those. Mm -hmm. So any other, any other questions? Um, thank you so much for your time, ladies. Your uh, time and comments are really uh, appreciated. Uh, we are a staffing company. We work with uh, several large national MSPs. And uh, I have two questions for you all. Uh, one is, um, if you all went back when you all first started your company, I'm sure there was a time where um, you experienced a lot of growth, and uh, how yes, did you scale? We, like, we cannot understand. We cannot. Can you hold the mic like okay, this? Okay, sure, sorry. So uh, when I, I want to go back when you started your company, and it was very small. I'm sure there was a time when um, you, know, you landed a large account, and uh, you wanted to scale. You wanted to scale your company. There was a challenge in scaling your company. How, what advice would you give us on how to scale your company, on how to get bigger, how to service more accounts, and how to uh, deliver? That's one question. And second question is, what does culture look like in successful companies like yours? Okay, so the What's your first question, so scale? How, 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 you scale did you, how did you manage, and when you started, you were small. Yeah, how you scale your company. How did you manage through that? Yeah, yeah. And then the second question is, the. The, the second question is about culture. culture. How would you manage uh, culture? What's, right. what's the, what does the culture look like right. in what's your company? What does the culture in your companies look like? Okay. So, as I said before, SDI was designed right from its inception to be global. Hmm. That's how we scale. We got, here in the state, we got a base the first two years, and we work with clients, and we show our clients that we were capable of taking national, local, national, and global contracts. We work with them. We follow our clients. We bring solutions to them, not only here in the States, but 
solutions in other countries where they were expanding themselves. That was pretty much the basic. We try to, I always say, try to figure out a way to make yourself indispensable to your clients. And I know that indispensable is difficult, it's a difficult thing, but right from the beginning, try to figure out a way. Be very thinking like 10 years, what's happened, what's coming. Try to figure out how I'm going to keep those clients, four or five very committed clients that we don't even call them clients, we call them partners because they are basically our partners. And let's work together where you go I'm going to be there for you. We became so global rapidly, open offices, again, just about in every country and in every country, because my, my clients, they will, hey, like Lenovo, for example, this is a Chinese company. Lenovo is our number one client nowadays. We're handling all the indirect procurement for them. Everywhere they are, we're there. Or we were there before, or we just followed them. That's the type of solutions. Again, try to make, figure out a way to make yourself indispensable for them. So to the question of scale, you know, I've been married to the same man for 38 years. Many of them have been very happy. Um, <laughs> and uh, today is a good day. Um, my husband says to our son and daughter, he, he will ask them, when is the best time to tell your mate you love them? And they laugh, yeah, dad, yeah, dad. And the answer is before someone else does. In the race to grow your business, make certain you're taking care and loving the customers you have. Their great reference is all that's going to matter to your brand as you continue to grow. It's always more important what someone else is saying about you than what you're saying about yourself, which bleeds into the question around culture. Now, not to escape from the importance of, uh, of, scale, of, of the question of scale, the, you've heard of the one-two loop? That's a question, have you? Oh, okay, because if you haven't, I'll share. If you have, I can shut up. One, two, loop. You heard me mention earlier about location is important. Technology allows us to have locations where people are not today. One, two, loop simply says, first, make sure you have a physical presence in the strategic places you need to be. Where is it absolutely critical that proximity becomes not a value, but a, but, but a necessity? Have people there. Don't promise what you can't deliver in terms of people. Number of people, oh, I've got, comp I've got offices here, offices here, offices here, post office boxes, okay? <laughs> Make sure you know the first place where you need to have people. Two, Make sure where you don't need to have people. Brick and mortar comes at a cost, and you have to integrate that cost into your process of growing. And the loop is making sure that you're revisiting that on whatever cyclical basis your business operates on, because that's going to change for you sometimes. Before Hong Kong repatriated to China, many people were definitely physically in Hong Kong, in a way that they're choosing different ideas around now. So you've got to be really, I, I, it's nice to say, oh yeah, do this and do that, and they're all aspirational, you know, but I'm, I, I'm telling you, if I'm too detailed, forgive me, but I believe you asked the question because you want to understand about scaling. In, 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 integrate one, two looping into how you're thinking. And then um, I think that it's really important also around culture for you to understand that you set the tone for that. Culture can kill businesses quicker than lack of service can. I, I, I had the occasion to study under Jack Welch, and one of the things Jack Welch told me was that, especially being in HR, two things about scaling. One, he said, historically, the CFO was in the right pocket of the CEO you gotta make sure that that CHRO is in your pocket as well. 
They control the funnel of everything about your business because they're controlling how talent is represented to you. You don't get to see them or know them in your organization without them coming through that process. For smaller companies, oftentimes you don't have an HR department. It becomes important that you integrate yourself into that interview process. The second thing that I think that is really important to you that blends your scaling with your culture is to understand um, it's something very simple. My mother-in-law told me when I asked her about having children and what she learned. My mom's an expert, 11 kids, one, one husband, okay? Uh, one mom, one dad. Um, but m my mother-in-law taught me, your children more attention pay to what you do than what you say. I would say that your associates and your employees do as well. You wanna make sure that your employees see you in every moment of exposure in the light that you're asking them to behave. Every company is in the branding business today. Every employee is an impact to your brand. How your employee, how that sales rep, how that service attendant shows up online, on social media, is as important to your company as what we used to print collateral that would tell people who we are. Now websites change monthly, so I would say that your, your scaling has to be very integrated in a way that shows the type of branding you want to represent about your company. They are inseparable more than ever. You don't get to print it and pass it out and next year have leftovers. That does not happen in today's world. Did that help you? So I'm gonna, um, we're over time. So, oh really? Okay, unless you... What a bummer. Okay. I mean, no. so, <laughs> I know, I know it's a pretty tight packed day, so I just want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time. Right. I don't know if you had anything. No. So with that, I think I'm just going to say thank you, ladies. Uh, this thank has you. been very insightful for me. Hopefully it's been for the audience. Give them a thank round you. of applause. Thank, right. you. thank you. Thank, yeah, you, thank guys. you guys. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Very nice meeting you. Yeah,